Welcome to my uh, Gresham Lecture this evening. Um, the second of a series of four lectures that I'm giving, which are my sort of reflections on the current state of um, heritage and planning um, and how we look after the past in our country. And tonight I want to talk about a um, very difficult and contentious subject, actually, which is housing. And uh, much of what I'm going to talk about this evening is, is about planning, but it's a quite a right, wide-ranging uh, talk, so um, we'll see where we get to. I think planning, you know, is never really out of the news, certainly as far as I can remember. Um, and it does seem to me that changing the planning system has always been a bit of a priority for the government. In 2012, they came with what I regarded was a very um, welcome reform. This was the National Planning Policy Framework, the so-called NPPF. At the time, there was quite a lot of fuss about it. People don't like change, but there were also, I suppose, some legitimate concerns about its direction. But in the end, I think what we got was possibly the most sophisticated planning framework in Europe, maybe even in the world. Now, like almost every other country in Europe, our planning system is based on the principle of sustainable development. This is a concept uh, originally defined in 1987 by the Brundtland Commission, which coined what has become its most often quoted definition, and I quote it, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And sustainable development is most often uh, expressed in terms of three dimensions or three pillars. So here I have sustainability supported by um, social, environmental, and um, economic uh, uh, factors. So economic growth, social inclusion, and environmental uh, balance. Now, the original um, Brundtland Commission um, and its definition of sustainable development was driven by concern about not using up more than our fair share of irreplaceable resources, including rainforests and fossil fuels, uh, basically conserving uh, resources for future generations so that they can meet their needs just like we meet ours. But heritage is also an irreplaceable resource. Like a rainforest, once you knock down uh, an old building or destroy an old place, it's gone. It's gone forever. Um, and so many people have argued that culture um, has um, an essential role in public planning and it should be a fourth pillar, a fourth pillar added to the first three, an edifice that is supported by economic prosperity, social equity, environmental sustainability, but also cultural vitality. So for many countries um, across the world, this four-pillar definition of sustainable development is the holy grail. Getting formal legal acceptance that culture, heritage if you like, uh, is part of the definition of sustainability. Well, remarkably, ladies and gentlemen, in 2012, this is what we got. The MPPF has enshrined in its opening pages that part of being sustainable in England is, and I quote, protecting and enhancing the historic environment. And without doing this, in English planning guidance, you are not contributing to sustainable development. Now, it's very easy to forget this as we gently get hot under the collar at various planning outrages. However, all the evidence is that on the whole, the NPPF has succeeded in getting heritage taken a bit more seriously as one of the key determinants of planning policy. Well, if only it was as simple as that. Politicians, as you know, can't leave anything alone. Since the publication of the NPPF, there have been flurries of announcements and pronouncements about how the planning system is all wrong. It doesn't work, apparently. At the end of George Osborne's reign at the Treasury, we saw the publication of a document called Fixing the Foundations, Creating a More Prosperous Nation. This is the government's so-called productivity plan, a 15-point plan to get national productivity up. Now, obviously, 
one of the things that's holding us back is the planning system. Fixing the foundations, as the document's called, tells us, that, and I, that, and I quote, an excessively strict planning system can prevent land and other resources being used efficiently. It then gives some evidence to prove that this is really the case in England. We're told that the planning system increases the cost of permission for major housing developments by three billion pounds a year. We're also told that planning constraints on commercial development are equivalent to a 250% tax on office space. This assault on the planning system has continued under the new Tory cabinet. Philip Hammond's £5 billion plan to boost house building came with, yes, you guessed it, a redrafting of the planning rules to introduce a presumption in favour of residential development. This presumption is needed, the argument goes, because England is full of NIMBYs. These NIMBYs are trying to stop house builders solve the housing crisis. So having abolished regional planning structures and delegated powers down to a local level, the government is now frustrated that local people and their elected members are not embracing all the lovely housing and commercial development that the government wants. And so the solution will be to take powers back to Westminster so that they can force things through. Now, that's not actually what the government is saying, but it is what actually the government means. Basically, despite the reduction of 7,000 pa pages of planning guidance achieved since 2012, the government still sees planning as an obstacle to economic development. Well, the protection of historic buildings in this country dates back to 1913. The Act of Parliament that year made it possible for the state to protect individual buildings judged to be of historic importance to the nation. This is Revo Abbey in Yorkshire. And it's from this 1930 Act um, 13 Act, hugely elaborated and expanded after the Second World War and then refined through the late 20th century, that we now have a national heritage protection system, which protects the fabric of places which have, to use the terminology, special interest. The national system is uh, a point designation system that protects single artefacts, like objects in a museum. And it's worth remembering this point because the national heritage agencies in Britain, CADU, uh, Historic England, Historic Scotland, can protect single buildings, but they can't, using their powers of designation, protect places. That power, the power to protect places, was of course given to local government by the Conservation Areas Act in 1967. Local authorities can designate places as being special on historic grounds if they choose to, and then they can, if they choose to again, police changes in order to ensure that that special character doesn't get eroded. But conservation areas are a very blunt instrument. This is a conservation area in Bath, and this is a conservation area in Neasden. Both protect the special character of the place, but I think the job of protection perhaps is slightly different. So when the arguments for the conservation of buildings and archaeological remains uh, developed from the 19th century, they were based on the protection of fabric, on preserving the very bricks and stones from which our past was constructed. Most protective legislation today, right the way across the world, is based on exactly this principle. However, I think there is, in most countries, a pretty broad-based consensus against the destruction of historic places. Of course, there are arguments at the margins about the desirability of preserving certain buildings or parts of buildings, but in most European countries, the principal argument about protecting our heritage has been won. Very, very few people think it's acceptable to demolish medieval churches, raise 18th century houses, or destroy Roman villas. 
What's much more difficult is the preservation of the wider significance of historic places. Because, of course, none of these buildings that are protected exist in isolation. They all have a spatial and a historical context. Look at Totnes here on the screen. Here we have a very special place, but one that is impossible to capture in some sort of legalistic term within the planning system. Its beauty and its charm lie in the very complex interaction between the urban and the rural parts of its landscape. The setting of this settlement is just as important as the individual components of the settlement itself. So the point is that what we are trying to protect today is very different from the original concerns of our forefathers. It's a much more complex task. It's not a black and white question of will fabric be destroyed or will it not be destroyed. In fact, questions of conservation are now, like most other areas of 21st century governance, they're complex, they're multi-layered, they're issues actually ill-suited to the black and white decision-making mechanisms that have grown up since the Second World War. So let me give you a couple of examples of relatively recent planning cases um, so you can see exactly what I mean. So first of all, we're going to... Does anyone know where this is? Anyways, you'd be very clever to get it. It's, this is Malmesbury. This is Malmesbury. It's a very ancient settlement, as you can see. It's, in fact, it's a 9th century Saxon burg. And it sits on a flat Cotswold hilltop here um, at the convergence of two branches of the River Avon. So the river comes round here, um, and the town is uh, 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 sitting in this sort of isthmus between them, just a, a few hundred yards across. And uh, this um, was a perfect site for our Saxon forebears to settle. This is a map of the centre of the town. It's a designation map showing um, e each of these uh, uh, triangles here is a listed building. And, of course, the whole of the centre here um, is shaded, this brown thing, because it's also a conservation area. But what you will see is that none of this actually uh, takes um, account of a crucial point, which is that uh, the uh, boundary between the town, which you can see white here, and the countryside, which you see in green here, is an absolutely fundamental part of uh, the place's character and history. Well, there was a big planning battle fought in Malmesbury uh, a couple of years ago. It was proposed to build a very large supermarket on the edge of the town. First it was going to be Sainsbury's, and then, uh, to the delight of the people who lived in Malmesbury, it turned out to be Waitrose. <laughs> and this is the site. Look at this huge site here, in the conservation area, on the other side of the river, in the green land around the uh, town. Well, should this have been allowed? This is the view out, uh, and this is where the supermarket was proposed. And you'll see uh, from this aerial view here, uh, here is the town centre, and here is the new supermarket. Um, and here you see the uh, green swathe that used to go around Malmesbury and give that very, very clear distinction to the historic centre, and here you see Waitrose being built in the foreground. Um, in my view, this uh, development completely destroys the historic setting of the town. And I think the important point to make here is that the fact that there are hundreds of listed buildings in here and that it's a conservation area made absolutely no difference to the planning decision to be made here because this was not deemed to have any impact upon the fabric of the historic buildings in the town. This is... I'm not going to ask you where this is because A, it's obvious, and B, it's written on the screen. This is Ely in the Fens. 
And at its heart, of course, is this fantastic cathedral, one of the most glorious and majestic sites anywhere in England. A cathedral that is defined by its relationship to the surrounding fen. This is where Hereward the Wake uh, hid as he conducted his guerrilla war against the Normans. Ely is an island, or was an island, and the cathedral was built at its highest point. But e Ely is also a big growth point, an easy commuting distance from Cambridge, and in fact, uh, uh, from London. And gradually, the historic town is being ringed with new areas of housing. And here you see um, Ely and historic map, there's the cathedral, and here are the wonderful views that you get uh, from all sides um, of, the, of the town, of the cathedral um, sticking up. But what um, actually has happened is that as uh, the housing development has developed, um, the views of the cathedral have been blotted out. So on the north side uh, of, of Ely here, you see all this red area, this is the new housing, and the views of the cathedral here really have all been completely compromised. But luckily, the good news is, is there are great views um, all the way around this side um, here. Now, Ely has a lot of listed buildings, and the cathedral is, of course, grade one. But in deciding whether the setting of the town might be affected by development, this grade one listing is worthless. My advice, ladies and gentlemen, is go to Ely quickly. Go there now. This weekend, next weekend, do not delay. Take a walk along the river. Enjoy the views that have been enjoyed since the Saxon period. Listen to the peaceful riffle of the river, river ooze. Listen to the birds and watch the cathedral in the distance. Because very soon, this will be your view. You will be standing by a massive dual carriageway that will slice through the fens, obliterating not only the last remaining views of the cathedral, but obviously shattering the tranquility of the river walks. This huge, brutal bypass has been approved, partially because the planners said there was no impact on the heritage of Ely. There was no impact on the heritage of Ely because it could not be demonstrated that the grade one listed building had been damaged by the building of this bypass. The cathedral, they said, is miles away from the bypass, and so the bypass could not possibly be a problem. So these two examples show how roads and supermarkets um, uh, are um, types of development that are eating up the countryside around our historic towns, giving no thought to how these places sit in the landscape, and heritage legislation can't do anything about it because the legislation protects individual buildings and not historic places. But neither roads nor supermarkets are anything compared to the big issue of housing. Well, you'll all know the basic facts about uh, housing. There is a political consensus on the fact that we need more houses. And actually, amongst voters, 69% of us apparently think that housing is one of the biggest issues of our day. The bare facts appear very simple. Due to an ageing population, immigration, and people living alone, we will need more than 5 million new homes in the next 25 years. So there's pressure to expand the housing stock, but not enough houses are being built. It has been estimated that we need 233,000 houses a year, but we are only building half that. And here you can see, if you drew a line down here, the decline in house building down to about 110,000 houses um, a year. The consequence is... Uh, that people want to move into houses that don't exist, and houses uh, have been rising in price very fast. We all know this. Between 1971 and 2012, house prices increased by 4,268%. And we know that if the price of a supermarket chicken had risen at the same rate over the same period it would now cost you £51.33. <laughs> or put another way, if a chicken 
had grown by 4,268%, it would be a very big chicken. Now, this is a very complex area, and I am in danger of simplifying things too much. But the fundamental question is, why can't the market provide the housing we need in the right places at an affordable price? And this uh, is the government's uh, assessment of the uh, percentage growth in the housing that is needed in a selection of historic towns uh, across um, England. Some people blame the house builders. Some people blame the councils. A lot of people seem to blame the planning system. And a lot of people seem to blame the so-called NIMBYs. Well, in my view, this uh, is uh, not getting to the root of the problem. Because uh, new housing, new neighbourhoods, and most new buildings are basically incredibly unpopular with the public. They see that precious England, uh, the country that defines us as a nation, is being raped by developers, ignorant councils, and incompetent architects. And meanwhile, the heritage protection legislation that they think can help them is completely and utterly powerless. Now, like everything, this has some history to it. Uh, last time there was a huge housing crisis was in the uh, 1960s and the early 1970s, a period in which architects managed to persuade the politicians that people would be happier, healthier, and more prosperous if they moved out of old Victorian houses into blocks of flats set in large open spaces. And so in that period, over one and a half million houses were knocked down and replaced by tower blocks like these. In some parts of London, uh, councils planned to demolish every single Victorian and Edwardian house. When he was uh, heritage minister, the late Lord Mackintosh, who um, was a leader of Hackney Council in the mid-1960s, uh, he uh, had planned to demolish every single Victorian house in Hackney and replace them with these uh, types of Victorian high-rise. And I remember when he, he was my minister when I was at English Heritage, I, I remember going, sitting in the office with him and asking him and saying, how on earth could you have thought that that was a good idea? And what he said to me was that I was too young to understand the sense of mission that his generation had his generation who had been on the beaches at D-Day. They wanted to make the world a better place. And they saw that this architecture was the way to do it. Never patronised the past. His uh, uh, sincerity was very, very deep. But it was a terrible period. When uh, town and city centres, this is the centre of historic Chester, uh, you see very sensitive... Um, uh, um, half timbering here, just so you know you're in Chester. Um, these places that had been spared the processes of industry, they'd escaped Hitler's bombs, but they were bulldozed to make way for ring roads, car parks, and high rise housing developments. Now, while initially these developments were popular, it very soon became apparent that it was all a terrible disaster. And places were being ripped apart by councils and architects' departments. In fact, by 1975, it all ground to a halt. Um, you know, previous phases of development in our national history and previous styles of architecture had been stopped by architects, by critics, by politicians. But this house building and this destruction in the 60s and 70s was stopped by popular revolt. The public hated it. And it created a terrible disjunction a disjunction that never happened before between the population and their architects. But of course, it wasn't only the buildings, it was the spaces around them. Thousands of years ago, man worked out what the nicest environments look like. Here's Rome, obviously not photographed recently, but a reconstruction of Rome. And uh, the Romans worked out how to build uh, towns and cities that felt good to live in, that fostered good feelings and good behaviours. And the components were incredibly simple. The street, the footpath, the square, and the park. And these simple components 
are the components of every place that you've ever been that you really like to be in. You can add a few refinements if you want, a river, a lake, a bridge, but basically streets work. But what happened in the 60s was that, was that people abandoned streets. This is what people were trying to go. This is the Gorbals in Glasgow. And you can see why people like Andrew McIntosh were determined to sweep away the poverty and the horror of uh, places like this. Um, here, here the, um, the Victorian tenements are being blown up and the new buildings are being raised uh, in the background. These tower blocks set in lawns, uh, in car parks, in open spaces. But these open spaces never became the cherished communal gardens that the architects hoped. They became wind corridors. They became dog laboratories. They became places to fly tip, race motorbikes, abandon cars. And so people uh, turned against these uh, places. But this is the optimism. Here is the Queen being shown the new development of the Gorbals. Gorb she looks a bit sceptical, I must say. Um, but, you know, no doubt she was very impressed at the time at this very brave plan, um, which looked great in, uh, in a model, but actually created a very inhuman uh, environment. And so this is one of the reasons why people are against housing development today. They just don't trust architects. They don't trust house builders. They don't trust councils to listen to them. As a result, two-thirds of British adults say they would never even consider buying a brand new house. Only 21% of us say that a new house is our favoured option. So these surveys tell one story, but the econom economic facts tell the same one. The Halifax Building Society tells us that prices fe fetched by traditional pre-1920 houses in a conventional street have risen 54 times faster than houses built after 1960. There's been an enormous amount of research into what sort of houses people like and what sort of houses people want to live in. And the facts are unequivocal. 90% of people aspire to live in a house in a street. And this is where we come to the problem. The house builders know this. After all, they are enterprising enterprises wanting to sell their products to consumers. But the system that we now have is not only fearsomely unpopular, it's a vicious circle that is destroying the countryside that we love so much. You see, house building is not done anymore by small independent developers, or at least not very often. It's controlled by volume house builders. These are extremely large companies with a duty to their shareholders, whose uh, business model relies on huge economies of scale. These uh, firms are extremely uh, powerful, lobbying central government uh, and bullying and threatening local authorities. A third of all new houses uh, in 2014 were built by just uh, five uh, firms. And this is basically how it works. A target um, is set by uh, a local authority for the uh, number of um, homes that needs to be built. Uh, land is allocated by the local authority uh, for the purpose. Uh, the developers then cherry pick the land that is easiest to develop. They then build extremely slowly, deliberately, because if they build quickly, they'd flood the market and the prices go down. So they release houses at just the right pace to keep the price uh, buoyant. And as a consequence, the targets are missed because they've only got the easy to develop land and they're building on it very slowly. And so the councils allocate more land. The developers then cherry pick it, they build slowly, and so the vicious circle uh, continues um, around. And all the time, this vicious circle is going, there is massive local protest. People who do not want their villages turned into uh, towns. They don't want large uh, um, housing developments on the outside. And I've just been driving around the countryside um, over the last few months. These are just a, a small selection uh, of the very large number of um, protests that I have seen um, uh, in relation to these uh, houses. 
So here is Ely again. This is the North Ely housing development site. And you can see that the way this big development site here tucks in uh, between the town, which is basically over here, the cathedral's sort of down here, and the A10 bypass that snakes around there. So a big chunk of land um, allocated by the council um, uh, for a development site. This site will be developed, de developed by a single developer with a single permission from the local authority. This is how everyone likes it. A farmer sells his fields in a single transaction. The developer puts a single planning application to the council. The council takes one decision, and bingo, you get an instant bit of new town built by a national house developer who will then pull a basic design off his computer and impose it on the place. So here you've got uh, Ely, but it doesn't need to be Ely. It could be Truro. It could be Lancaster, it could be Godalming, it could be Hereford. It doesn't matter where you are, you get exactly the same design of house. And very often, you get a design of house which has a nice brick bit at the front, but so they don't have to put the expensive brick all the way through, they have rendered block work at the back. In reality, you know, for the developers, this building is a secondary activity. As I've said, you build at a speed that covers the cost of capital and yields around a 20% margin, but not so fast that it either floods the market or eats up the supply of land. If the price of land goes up, the quality of what you build goes down, because to maintain the margin, you squeeze the design. More plastic, less brick, more standardization, smaller units. So, this is uh, the cost of a new house that you pay £220,000 for. It actually only costs you, um, you £80,000 to build. The lands cost you £80,000, the tax is £40,000, your profit is £20,000, and your £220,000 house actually cost £80,000 to build, for which you actually can't get very much. But... You might ask, don't the local authorities care about the quality of design and build? Well, I'm afraid the answer is not enough. Most local authorities are far too focused on technical compliance rather than design. Basically, what has happened is that the bureaucrats have got control of the places where we live. Now, some of you may have followed the saga of Mount Pleasant uh, in Islington. This is a very interesting thing. It's been in the papers quite a lot. This is the vast former post office uh, site, the Royal Mail site, which uh, the Royal Mail wants to develop in a £100 million scheme. They've engaged some very good architects. But what the very good architects have produced is, in my view, very bad. Uh, this is what they're proposing here. Uh, it's opposed by almost everybody who lives within uh, a mile of it. The scheme will create 680 uh, new homes in 10 tower blocks, some of which are 15 storeys high. There won't be any streets, uh, there won't be any pavements or squares. Uh, there will be this uh, uh, area called public realm, which means uh, privately owned spaces controlled by security guards. Well, the local community action group have commissioned their own designs, which you see here. To prove that on exactly the same site, you could build something that is of a more human scale. The proposals, as they stood, they argued, could have been built absolutely anywhere. The proposed streets uh, lead to a central circus, which they believe looks much more like London. The buildings they propose are five or six storeys high and actually can create 730 housing units, 7% more than the proposed scheme. 99% of local residents supported this uh, solution over the post office's scheme. Well, the scheme was uh, called in by the late mayor, Boris Johnson, and was given permission uh, uh, by him while he called the local objectors, who are the people who proposed this, 
He called them bourgeois nimbies. Nearby, in Shoreditch, Boris also took decision-making away from the local council to determine a massive housing development of, um, um, uh, himself. The emasculated local councillors took out this poster. This is the local council putting out this poster on the streets, uh, uh, protesting that they had lost the power to uh, determine um, the uh, living environment of their own residents. What I'm trying to say is that politicians are asking the wrong questions. They ask, how can we build more homes? How can we force them through faster? What they should be asking is, how can we make house building more popular? The plan should be to find ways of making people want new houses, making people argue for new houses, making people lobby for them, instead of fighting against them the whole time. We need a revolution that puts people back in charge of where they live. We need places of a human scale that satisfy basic human needs, such as community, interaction, and streets. So what is it that can be done? Well, my first point is that heritage legislation, as it stands, can do little or nothing to protect historic towns. And so we need to turn to other methods to achieve our ends. First is the issue raised by my examples at Malmesbury and Ely. Historic buildings have a setting, and people have long argued to protect these. But historic settlements uh, have uh, settles, uh, sorry, uh, um, have settings um, that need to keep these places um, distinct and compact without bleeding out into the countryside. And part of the issue here is about density. Historic settlements are, gener generally speaking, extremely dense. Now, this is an excellent map done by my friend Spencer de Grey, one of Norman Foster's uh, partners. Um, they have been uh, campaigning on this issue uh, with, with me. And what this map shows is Kings Lynn, uh, a market town in North Norfolk of about 40,000 people. Now, uh, some of you will smile because those, some of you have been to my lectures before and know that I live in Kings Lynn. But it is a very good example because uh, it's somewhere that I know very well and so I can you know, talk with a bit of authority. Now, in 1200, here, right in the centre, uh, Kings Lynn had a population of about 5,000 people. That was quite big at the time. The place was a major port. But the number of people in each hectare of the town was around 89 to 90. So about 89 to 90 people per hectare in 1200. As the Tudors, Stuarts, the Georgians expanded the town with terraces and townhouses, the density was still quite high, you've still got people um, over uh, 83 people per hectare. But just look what happened uh, after that. By 1998, 1988, housing was being built at less than half of the density, only 30 people per hectare. And the new housing that's being uh, proposed in these areas uh, outside uh, 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 the country is only 21 people per hectare. In other words, using up huge amounts of land housing very small numbers of people. But actually, when you look at most historic settlements, they have a significant amount of space within them that can be redeveloped. Some of this, of course, is vacant spaces above shops, empty buildings, but an awful lot of it is brown field land, land that has been previously developed but is now um, either unused or um, derelict. Well, here is um, Kings Lynn, looked at from the river. There is our house just there. That's our Elizabethan Tower. Uh, we're open to the public in the summer. You're very welcome to come and have a look if you'd like. Um, little advert there. Um, but uh, it was a prosperous place in the Middle Ages, but it, in the mid-19th century, went to sleep. The port scaled down. The town stagnated in size. But after the Second World War, um, Kings Lynn signed uh, a London overspill agreement. And in preparation for the uh, uh, influx of new residents who were going to work uh, in the uh, new food press processing plants, work uh, began. These are the houses that were built for the London overspill. 
uh, work began uh, on uh, modernising the town. Uh, everyone would travel by car, it was thought, and so the big priority was to build roads and car parks. Uh, and so what happened was uh, all these red dots here in the centre of the town are areas of housing that were demolished in the... Hello? What's happened, crucially to my... Thank you very much. Come back again. Uh, um, uh, areas of housing demolished in the centre of the town for surface uh, car parks. 36 hectares of surface car parking in the centre of this small historic town. Now, I'm hoping that is a glitch that is going to be, um, come back again. Um, it has to be admitted that um, some of this uh, uh, is in... A, in, in the out-of-town retail areas, oops, uh, which is here. But you know, in, in the centre of the town here, um, there are um, car parks uh, which uh, cover um, many um, hundreds uh, of, of square um, metres. Now, uh, look at this. It's, this is quite an interesting um, uh, 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 picture. Here's one of the surface car parks, um, which, you see, which you see here. And here is the town's only uh, multi-storey car park. In this surface car park here, it takes 21 square metres to park a car. So this little blot on the townscape can park 58 cars in 1,215 square metres. Uh, in the multi-storey car park, you can park 645 cars in 3,900 square metres. So it only takes six square metres to park a car here, where it takes 21 square metres to park a car here. So with a quick bit of calculation, you can work out that if the town were to build another multi-storey car park, you could rela release at least six hectares of surface parking in the centre of the town. Now, if you assume that only half of each of these town centre car parks was built on, you could actually build 92,000 square metres of housing in the centre of the town, which is 1,000 new dwellings. And you can do that without the town increasing one inch. By building in the centre of the town, you revitalise the town centre, you reduce traffic, you reduce infrastructure. And in fact, uh, by infilling you can meet the entire housing allocation of King's Lynn without taking another inch of countryside um, uh, um, round the outside. Now, I think the best way to discuss these issues is by way of example, which is why I've gone into a bit of detail about King's Lynn. But I don't want you to think that King's Lynn is a special case, because what happened in Lynn happened in almost every historic town in England. They, uh, hundreds of historic towns uh, have um, the, these uh, large areas of brownfield sites and commercial areas which can be built on and which would allow you to draw um, a, a red line round the historic town and infill and take most, uh, if not all, of the uh, new housing. Now, it has to be said that the government absolutely recognises the importance of brownfield land and makes it clear that this is going to be a big area of focus. It wants to create, in fact, what it calls uh, a, an urban planning revolution in brownfield sites. And in fact, 73 councils across England uh, have been asked to pilot um, brownfield registers. Uh, these registers, which will uh, list all the brownfield land in their area, which will provide um, house builders with up-to-date information on <coughs> brownfield sites available for um, housing. And the idea is, is that this will help uh, house builders uh, find sites uh, um, rapidly, speeding up the construction of new homes. But permission is going to be given, uh, in principle, uh, to, to uh, develop these uh, brownfield sites uh, with sort of no questions asked. The council will be required to consider technical issues, and we don't yet know whether one of these technical issues is going to be the design of the houses. So the jury is out. The principle is good, but clearly the design is going to be absolutely uh, critical. And we can come back to this uh, uh, later. So how do we deal 
uh, with the overbearing and homogenizing power of the, uh, the, the volume house builders' house designs, because it's hard to imagine that uh, uh, when you build in brownfield, it's going to be much more expensive. Uh, I can't imagine that the designs are going to necessarily be much better. Um, and what I think is very interesting is another one of the government's priorities is devolution. And I think what we've seen in Scotland and Wales is something really rather remarkable because devolution has unquestionably, in the home countries there, reinforced a sense of identity. And identity in this sense is intimately tied up with a sense of place. The place where you live, where you come from, makes up a big part of your identity. And so in theory, devolved powers should be interested in reinforcing a sense of place. And I think there's some evidence to suggest that this is, in fact, happening. So in Cornwall, over the last um, 10 years... Ah, hold on. This is not Cornwall. Uh, this is Norfolk. This is just um, some eye candy, really, just to show you um, these, what I'm talking about, these towns, um, all of which have got um, space in them for uh, new housing development, um, uh, and all of which have this very special relationship with the countryside that you wouldn't want to destroy. And here, slightly out of focus, um, is Cornwall. And here, what has happened, the county council has created a, a countywide landscape assessment. And what this uh, does is it points out that if you are going to build new houses in one of these areas, you need to comply with... Uh, certain um, housing guidance which ensures that the new house you build conforms to the regional house building styles, uh, patterns and uh, materials. And this, um, I think, is a fantastic uh, development because it means that a, house, a, 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 a volume house builder cannot build in one of these areas without complying with the design codes laid down by the county council. So this could form a model which could, be, uh, which could be rolled out across the countryside to deal with some of the issues of homogenization that I'm talking about. But there's something else that could be done too. Because as so often, looking back into history can help us out. And when you do look back in history, you can see that all the most successful housing developments historically tend to be done by um, estates who have had a long-term interest in their developments. So in London, this would be the Grosvenor Estate, the Portman Estate, all those big uh, uh, estates which still uh, own the freeholds of the land they have developed. And all these estates, and this also includes new firms like British Land, like Hammerson or like Delancey, they take a long-term stake in the development. They're not there to make a quick in and a quick out. They build and they retain a stake in the development. And so as a consequence, they build better quality and a better quality of place, and they manage it for long-term returns. A ground rent is a valuable thing. And if it's only, um, uh, uh, um, if it's only a, a, a small sum of money, a large development obviously generates um, a large ground rent. So if a way could be found to encourage long-term ownership by uh, the house builders, you would probably get a much uh, better quality uh, building. But I also think that you can come at this from another direction. It's sometimes very difficult to see where we sit today in uh, 2016 in a historical perspective. But I think we should remember that when the history books um, are written in 100 years' time, our lives will fall into the chapter that describes the aftermath of the Second World War. I sometimes forget that the war had only ended 17 years before I was born, not very long time. But in that period um, that we've lived in through the Second World War, the balance has been very strongly in the state determining uh, what should take place. But I think the balance is beginning to swing the other way. People's attitude to government and to democracy is changing. And of course, the vote to leave the EU was an exertion of popular protest against a political consensus. And so I think we need to look more closely at the role of the individual to uh, champion our 
heritage. And here we come to a bigger philosophical issue, a debate about who owns our heritage and who should take responsibility for it. And here we come back to an idea, we come to an idea, which has been in existence since the Middle Ages. This is the idea of the commons, an institutional arrangement for the collective management of natural resources or natural property. And when you talk about a common, this is a piece of land that's owned by everybody um, for, uh, for, for grazing or for forests or irrigation or something. And such commonly owned resources have always faced social dilemma. In particular, commonly owned resource uh, managed collectively is always at a risk of overuse because communal ownership threatens its very existence. And social scientists have called this the tragedy of the commons. This is a, a situation where self-interested individuals acting independently fail to cooperate with everybody else and behave um, in such a way as to deplete a commonly held uh, resource. Um, the Nobel Prize winning political economist Eleanor Ostrom pointed out that uh, trying to control commonly owned um, assets um, through state action isn't actually the most effective way of doing it. And she demonstrated that this tragedy of the commons, you know, the destruction of commonly owned property by people acting irresponsibly, is not inevitable, and communities can develop a third way of governments, uh, a way of avoiding these um, uh, conflicts, you know, conflicts. Now, this is important because heritage is fundamentally a common. Those views of Ely, the views of Malmesbury, the character of King's Lynn, the character of Mount Pleasant, are all commonly held goods. They belong to everybody that lives there. They don't just belong to the developers. And deterioration or destruction of those commonly owned landscapes um, are a version of the tragedy of the commons. And this is seen in uh, very... Oops, that's not what I meant to show you. I'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, in so many um, countries, um, just think of the Algarve. Many of you have been to the Algarve, a place where everybody went to because it was so charming, these little fishing ports. Then hotels were built all over it, and they destroyed the very thing that people came there um, to see. And so I think that this um, third way of looking at commonly owned heritage assets is about communi community cultural responsibility, a way out of the um, heritage tragedy of the commons. And so, in many ways, localism is a political expression of this idea of the commons. And I think it potentially provides a vehicle for arguing the responsibility for the heritage commons being transferred to local people. But there are two big problems with this idea. The first is a perception amongst uh, people that is, is the responsibility of the state to safeguard collective heritage rather than the duty of the citizens. And this can lead to a reluctance to take on responsibilities. You know, the government should sort it out. But the very environment that we are trying to protect was originally created by communal and private enterprise. It wasn't created by planning or state action. What you see here was created by individuals. And therefore, it should be possible to replicate a model where society takes back control of the places where it lives. But the second problem, and this is even more difficult about uh, the, uh, the commons, is a potential clash between the people and the experts. Because if a community wants to sweep away their own heritage, uh, heritage that might be of national value, um, experts university professors, amenity societies, historic England, people like me, uh, might actually oppose the local people. And so for lots of people in Malmesbury, they actually wanted a Waitrose. And a large number of people in Ely wanted the bypass. And so the experts and the people can find themselves in disagreement about actually what is the best thing to do for this commonly owned resource, that is the heritage. 
So how is it that we can encourage people to take on responsibility for the places where they live and have pride in the common history and heritage? Well, I think that central government can help. And here I float an idea. This is Liverpool, the three graces. In 2008, Liverpool was selected as the European capital of culture. And it had this extraordinary successful delivery of a year of uh, cultural events. Really important moment in defining the power of heritage to transform both the image and the reality of a city. The city of culture in Liverpool convinced politicians that heritage was a positive economic force rather than a cost to the city's economy. And it was this perceived sense of, uh, um, of heritage that was so successful in Liverpool 2008 that led to an announcement uh, the following year by the government that there would be a UK capital of culture in 2013. That went to Londonderry. A second UK capital of culture will be staged in Hull in 2017. And I've been to Hull very recently. I've talked to the people in the council. And there is a real sense in Hull that enriching the city's heritage will make it a more attractive place for business. And they're developing a heritage strategy that will reposition Hull's place in the world with ambitious, well-marketed projects that will grow a cultural economy and develop a strong a series of independent cultural uh, organisations. So I think that there are ways you can stimulate this local pride that becomes incredibly intense. But of course, if you're waiting to be the European capital of culture, you may actually wait for a very long time after Brexit. Um, and even if you're waiting uh, to be the UK capital of culture, you may wait for a very long time. So I think that the government needs to think of a new scheme. And this is my idea. I think the government needs to create a scheme that gives recognition to historic towns, stimulating pride, and help kickstart that sense of local responsibility for the way the place looks, both in the council and amongst the people who live there. I think that we should have a new designation. Not a planning designation, we've got lots of those, but a designation that recognises the special character of historic places. The character, which I've argued tonight, can't be protected by any existing part of the heritage protection system. The government could designate a number, perhaps a fixed number of towns, as heritage towns. Now, the word heritage isn't very good because it sort of employs, implies fossilisation, so the, might, the name might be different, but you get a badge, a label, a designation, and you become a sort of heritage town. And this gives you not only a sense of pride, but it gives you access to um, advice, grants, all sorts of things you can use to promote your place. Now, the French have this. It always galls me to, to have to say that the French do something really well that we do badly. But the French have this, and it's a really excellent scheme. They um, identify here... Oh, golly. We, they identify here these towns of history and art. And here they all are. You can apply to be one. And uh, there are 167 of them. And in these towns, there's a real sense of pride that they've been designated, these heritage towns. And uh, they can only keep that label if they keep up the standards, if they don't uh, make bad planning decisions, um, and if they continue to nurture their public heritage. So uh, my, uh, one of my ideas tonight, I mean, various ideas littered through this lecture, is that there needs to be a way of stimulating local pride in these places so that people take control of their heritage um, and uh, preserve it um, and resist some of these uh, problems that I've um, outlay, outlined uh, this evening. So we do need a different way forward. We need a way that makes house building popular, that doesn't set up councils and house builders against residences, uh, that, residents, uh, that takes this terrible language away, um, calling people nimbies. If anyone in this room is not a nimby, I'll come along and I'll build a waste destructor in your backyard. <laughs> you know, I mean, we're all NIMBYs. Of course we are. So let's get rid of that language. We need to instill a sense of shared pride in our history and in the history and heritage of our places. And until we get this, we won't take the aggro out of the system and we will not get the houses that we need. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, next time in my next lecture, I should be looking in a bit more detail about what happens when you try and build uh, new buildings in old places. And I very much hope you will join me uh, then. Thank you very much. <laughs>